Oh, hello. Here we are, calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London, calling Rick Beyer in Chicago. Uh, this is Rick Beyer. How you doing, Chris? I'm I'm fine. I'm a little warm and steamy. It was uh, 30 degrees today in London, so it a uh, little that's, toasty. That's centigrade, the, the devil temperature there? Not so Fahrenheit. about 90. Okay, thank about, you for, about 90. for translating for the rest of You're the world. You're welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone, to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And Chris and I can be found every Sunday. Every Almost Sunday. every Sunday in the same spot uh, uh, on the History Happy Hour Facebook and YouTube pages. So you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. And do let us know uh, that you're here and uh, where you're watching from. Uh, and, and Chris, before we, we say hello to a few of the people joining us, I just want to know if you've recovered at all from the terrible shock of a week ago when Can England we just lost in the Euro lost no, in the Euro Championship. No, I'm You're just not recovered. No. <laughs> okay. All right. So who do we have joining us today? I think uh, we had Marcus once again. This was Mark, here well, at the we beginning. can't start without Marcus. Yeah. No. Uh, we Valerie from Normandy. John and uh, Candice from Kansas, which almost is an alliterative phrase. Uh, who else? Uh, Doug McCord. Doug, where's the fun fact of the day? I mean, he's, he's, he's letting us down there. Perfect. And um, you're not letting us down, Doug. We appreciate you being here. Uh, and Nancy and Daniel and all sorts of other people who are gathering yeah to uh to uh check us out to what we're doing today so uh chris do you think we're we're ready to get going i believe we probably are yes well help us out Brrr. The bar is open. The bar is open. And since I'm going to flip it, flip this around a bit, what are you drinking this week? Rick? Oh my goodness! Well, I have a I have a Polish beer that wow. I'm drinking this week. Okay. And is that about, is that beer? Or is it a beer like substance? It, I haven't tried it yet, so I can't um, tell you. They told me it was the Budweiser of Poland, so my <laughs> so you got a lot to look forward to. Are very low. And how about you? Do you have a, a drink yet? Well, I only have a glass of water because oh. the young lady who was going to make my cocktail hasn't arrived yet. So Hopefully, she's watching and, and gets the I idea so. that she needs to to, yeah. to get in this. Um, Chris, today we are exploring uh, a story that takes place in Poland, the incredible little-known story of Jewish women involved in active resistance against the Nazis in Poland during World War II. And our guest, uh, Judy Battalion, uh, uh, wrote recently about her wonder coming across this forgotten story. She said, where I had expected mourning and gloom, I found guns, grenades, and espionage. This was a Yiddish thriller telling the stories of Polish-Jewish ghetto girls who paid off Gestapo guards, hid revolvers and teddy bears, flirted with Nazis, and then killed them. <laughs> it does sound exactly like our kind of story. Yes. Uh, Judy Battalion is an author and historian who has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Vogue, among others. She's a graduate in Harvard. She moved to London to pursue a PhD in heart, art history, not heart history, which would be a totally different subject. And today she lives and works in New York City. Judy, welcome to History Happy Hour. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Oh, yeah. it's, it's our absolute it's our pleasure. pleasure. Now um, I'm going to want to write a book about heart history. Heart yeah, I know, history. right? I'm writing that down. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Feel know. free to use that. I know. <laughs> I will. <laughs> from, from our missayings come the best ideas, right? Oh, uh, yeah. The things that we wouldn't have thought of. Listen, I'm just going to start off with a, just an easy and very general question. We've kind of talked about the general topic, but how did you come to this topic of women Jewish resistance fighters in Poland? Did you just wake up one day and say, that's what I want to write about? Or what's, what's your journey there? Um, I definitely did not just wake up one day and say, World War II! <laughs> um, I came across this topic completely by accident. Um, I This was serendipity. And I'll, I'll tell you the story. Everyone has a drink with them. So sit back, relax. It's a long story. It was, it was the spring of 2007. It was 14 wow. years ago. Wow. And I was living in London at the time. Um, 
And I was, it was a time in my life where I was thinking a lot about my Jewish identity. I am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors myself. And I was, but I was thinking about what I call the emotional legacy of the Holocaust, the way that trauma has passed over generations. Um, in my own life, I'm a very anxious person and everything felt very dangerous to me. And I, I started to wonder whether my, my Holocaust heritage was shaping how I perceived, how I reacted to everyday dangers. Um, and that's what I started to research. That's what I was thinking about. I decided to write a performance piece about Jewish women confronting danger. And I wanted it to have a historical backbone. The first Jewish woman I thought of who had confronted danger was someone named Hannah Senish. Um, she's someone I had studied back in fifth grade. Hannah Senish um, was a Hungarian Jew. She had moved to what was then Palestine in the 1930s. She was a poet, she wrote songs, she was a lyricist. But during World War II, she decided she wanted to fight back. She joined the Allied forces. She became a paratrooper and volunteered to return to Nazi-occupied Europe to, to fight the Nazis. Um, she was caught very early on, but legend had it, she looked her executioners in the eye when they shot her. I grew up with Hannah Senesch as a symbol of Jewish courage, of bravado. But back in 2007, I, I, didn't, wanna, I didn't wanna know about Hannah Senesch, the hero. I wanted to understand Hannah Senesch, the person. Like what poet decides to become a paratrooper and jump out of airplanes? Mm -hmm. what, what motivates the, the kind of audacity and bravery necessary to, to choose to go fight Nazis? That's what I was interested in. And I decided that I, I wanted to find a nuanced biography of Hannah Senesch, someone who had really explored her, her psychology that led me to the British Library, where I typed Hannah Senesch into the catalog, and there were not very many books about her, so I just ordered whatever they had. And one of the books that came back to me was a little bit unusual. It was an old book with yellowing pages and a blue fabric cover with golden writing, and it was in Yiddish. And it was called Foyen in the Ghettos, Women in the Ghettos. But I always say even more unusual than the book is the fact that I speak Yiddish. So I start looking through this book, reading, looking for Hannah Senesch, and I can't find her. She's only in the last few pages. In front of her, there is, you know, 150, 160 pages of small script Yiddish of stories of dozens and dozens of young Jewish women who fought the Nazis and primarily fought them from the Polish ghettos. Um, there were bios and obituaries and essays and excerpts and, and photos as well. And I, I mean, with chapter titles like weapons and ammunition, um, partisan combat, there was an ode to guns. And this was so different than any Holocaust narrative I'd ever come across at, from a family of survivors, from a community of survivors. I, I'd never heard anything like this. Um, and so I, I was going to say, I decided to write this book. I feel like the book decided to to make me Brilliant. write it. <laughs> yeah, um, and I know that feeling. It, you know, it was, you know, for 12 years, I, I worked on this um, on and off. It, it took many different forms, but eventually ended up in this book, The Light of Days. So one of the things that... Um seems central to we'll get into individual characters as we go along but one of the things that really struck me is how um, involved these young women were in these various youth organizations you talk about freedom and the young guard um, and that seemed to be really important to them becoming who they became once the war came so just to kind of set the scene could you describe for um, our viewers a little bit about these organizations and maybe what they were all about and what drew these young women into them for sure. Um, so in the 1930s, which is now my new favorite period, I'm like obsessed now with Poland <laughs> in the 1930s, um, Jewish youth was largely organized into these youth movements. 
they were, uh, I always say it was like the scouts, but more so. These youth movements were intellectual, social, emotional, uh, and spiritual, really, training grounds for young Jews. A hundred thousand young Jews were members of youth movements. And they were often, they were either directly affiliated with political parties or they had political stances to them. These were value-driven groups. Um, I speak most in my story about women who were from the socialist secular groups. Some of them were Zionists, some of them were not Zionists, they were Bundists, but they were primarily, they were socialists, they were secular, they were not religious, but they believed in certain shared values, community, collaboration. They often, they read psychology, psychoanalysis. They talked about their strengths and weaknesses. They talked about how to work together. They thought about this very much. They were obviously, you know, women leaders in many of these groups. They studied female revolutionaries. Women had leadership roles in the units of the groups. And, uh, and that was important as well. They were also really believed in Jewish pride, pride in our history, pride in our people, and self-sufficiency. They were, you know, we, we're not going to wait around. We're going to take action. We're going to do this ourselves. They were social action groups. They believed in charity. Uh, they helped the community. And all these, they were also, they were, they were very organized. They had strong leadership structures. And many young Jews left their family homes to move into communes with their youth movements. There were what we call kibbutzim all over Poland. And often parents were very upset about this. Why is my child leaving to, to be a hippie in the, in the, <laughs> in the kibbutzim? And, but young Jews did that. So they, they actually worked together. They lived together. They knew each other well. They had strong bonds. They trusted each other. And these were the groups that not only where women learned to act, to analyze, to plot, confidence, social, emotional awareness, and physicality too. They, they were farms, they worked the land. These were also groups, they were, they were very, th these are the groups that became the undergrounds in the ghettos. You know, you, you paint a very vivid picture of Jewish life in Poland before the war and specifically in uh, uh, Beijing. Uh, if I'm if I'm close, how am I, how am I doing there? Um, uh, but this idea that it was kind of a, a sort of a brief golden age, a flowering of literature and poetry and theater, you know, and and I I got the feeling reading this, um, I don't know, very strongly, and it just I don't know if, if it's just the way you wrote about it, of of how it must have felt like the earth had literally fallen away under their feet when the Germans came, the terror began, and everything that they knew about life, their whole life, it, it, I mean, literally like the building in Florida, it literally collapsed under their feet. Um, I, 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 it just really struck me how, how, in a way it hadn't before, how terrifying that moment must have been and how it changed everything in a heartbeat. I mean, I was just reading, this was someone else's words. I was reading, he said, Jews in the 1930s in Poland saw themselves as post-war Jews, not pre-war Jews. Mm. They were after World War I. They were living in a, yes, a flourishing cultural moment. Um, very extremely diverse Jewish community from the religious to totally assimilated, from small town to city, sophisticated city dwellers, Polish speakers, Yiddish speakers, Hebrew speakers, French, German, Russian. Um, this was a, a, a large flourishing community that, sure, they knew there was some anti-Semitism and difficulty in Germany. They knew there was anti-Semitism in Poland as well. They'd been dealing with that for a thousand years. Um, but they'd also been a thriving community for a thousand years, and and they and they weren't Germany. Germany's another country. They 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 knew there was political unrest in Europe, especially closer to September thirty nine. But they, they, they of course they had no idea this was a diverse, sophisticated community. So uh, that so, but but how did they react? Uh, and what I mean by that is how did they 
get themselves organized because the narrative, the popular narrative is that there wasn't resistance, that there wasn't a fight back, but clearly, you know, they saw this threat, they reacted to it, they organized as best they could. How does that happen? How do they say, okay, wait a minute? Well, it happens over time. I mean, the, uh, you know, September 1st, 1939, no one said, okay, that's it. We, we know there's right. going to be a killing of all the Jews. We have to organize. Nope. I mean, th nobody knew what was right. going to happen. So, you know, they were, of, of course, reactive and seeing what was happening and, and really trying to be truthful with themselves and with their community about what the Nazis were doing and what they stood for. Um, but this goes back to the youth movements. These movements were organized before the war. And that is why they became effective, successful undergrounds. They, they had been organized. These people knew each other. They lived together already. So when they were brought in, when they were forced into ghettos, imprisoned in, in ghettos in Poland, they often lived together in the ghettos. And they, when they began, they began as undergrounds that were really helping the community, setting up soup kitchens and doing performances and even traveling the country when they were not allowed to, but they snuck out and did giving lectures and bringing, they published anthologies about stories from Jewish Jewish heroes from the past, they were trying to spread spiritual and charitable activity. Um, but as they began to understand the true nature of the Nazis' genocidal plan, they, they became militias. They became underground guerrilla movements that knew they had to fight back. You know, uh, perhaps the central figure in your story is a woman who at first you only knew when you encountered her. Uh, as uh, Renya K. I uh, didn't even have a name really for her. Uh, tell us a little bit about her and why she is central to this tale. So Ren when I first found that Yiddish book, that unusual Yiddish book, the there was one entry in the middle. It was that book was a collection um, of, as I mentioned, different bits of memoirs, obituaries, some journalistic pieces, some essays. It, it was a, a series of excerpts. And in the middle, there was one long excerpt. And this piece grabbed me from day one. And it grabbed me because it was written in a very matter of fact, detailed tone. It wasn't many of the writers, as I mentioned, they were socialists. They wrote with this very strong socialist political overtones. This was not. This felt very modern, very now. It, it, her writing was, it was clear in narrative and her narrative was incredible and now i'll go on to tell you a bit about that and so she gripped me from the start she felt like a relatable young woman uh so relatable to me relatable to a contemporary audience renia was about 15 when the war began um and she was a stenographer she had attended public school she studied to be a stenographer she worked in the town court and then of course her whole life fell apart. Um, Hitler invaded her town of Jenstochow. Um, she was defiant in the ghetto from early on. She would sneak out and trade family heirlooms for food to help feed her family. Her and her family knew they were going to be killed. And they made a plan to escape the ghetto. They split up. They each took whatever money they had. They sold whatever they had and took whatever cash they had. They split it and she went by herself. And Renya set out, she looked good, which meant that she was a little bit lighter tone. She could pass as a Catholic pole. Um, she, and she, she went to public school. We can come back to that like many women. So she spoke a good Polish. So she could pass for a non-Jew. And so she decided to try to exist in Nazi occupied. But she, I mean, she traveled through fields and forests and got and tried to find people where she could stay, but nothing was safe. Um, she was once on a train and someone recognized her from Jenstochow, from her town. And she knew she got up, she picked up her little valise, she walked to the end of the train to the sort of balcony area and jumped off. Um, because she knew if she got to that next stop, they, they would report her and she would be taken. 
Um, Renya found a job working for a part German family as a housekeeper, a housemaid. This is a number of the women in my story did this. Um, and, you know, she would go to church every week. She would copy the, the movements of everyone sitting near her. This was a terrifying experience. This was a perform. They would call it a, an acting job with no intermission. Um, mm. But she decided she, she missed her sister, her older sister, Sarah. And she found a way to contact her through a still functioning postal service, which also kind of blew my mind. And Sarah managed to smuggle her over to this town of Bijin, um, as you said before, pronouncing it very well. In, in Yiddish, the Jewish community called it Bendin. So if you if you were Jewish, you have family from there, you would have called it Bendin. Um, but Bijin is, is a, a sort of, I believe, how it is pronounced now in Polish. And Bijin had been a very sophisticated Jewish community pre-war near Germany. And they had a developed underground. And when Renya got there, the underground wanted to stage an uprising. But their like headquarters of the underground was in Warsaw. So they needed a connector to Warsaw. They needed someone to go get weapons, to get information, to just maintain contact. And the courier girls, this was a role for these young Jewish women who had been doing that, were all had all been killed. And they needed someone new. Oh, so and there was a job opening. Yeah. Like there was a job opening. Rania was 18. She looked good. And so they asked her to go. And she said, yes, of course, I'll go. And so she became the um, the runner, the courier between Warsaw and Bijin ghettos for about six months in 1943, transporting fake IDs, uh, weapons, guns, uh, ammunition, and also rescuing people, taking people out of the ghetto and bringing them to safe spots um, in, in hiding in Warsaw. Mm. So, so Judy, you, you, um, there's a quote in your book, you said, uh, from, again, forgive the pronunciation, but Cheka Grossman, who says that Jewish girls were the nerve centers of the movement. What, what did she mean by that? Heike Grossman. There you go, of course. Um, yeah, come on, Chris. Heike Grossman. Heike. 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 That's um, a Dutch lesson. So Heike, she, she was talking about these, in particular, these women, the courier girls. So these were young Jewish women, like Renya, 18, 19, 20 years old, who could pass or disguise themselves so they could pass. They dyed their hair, they blanched skin, they changed their clothes. They performed as Christians and slipped in and out of ghettos doing work on the outside, on the Aryan side, where a Jew would be killed if they were found on the Aryan side. Um, these young Jewish women, at the beginning of the war, they mainly connected the ghettos, bringing information, bringing hope showing people that they hadn't been forgotten, that they were communicating with Warsaw, with Vilna, with other cities. Um, these Jews in ghettos were not allowed to have newspapers. They didn't have radios. It was often young Jewish women who brought the news, even the news of the Nazi genocidal plan. As the war developed, as the undergrounds again became militias, these Jewish women began arming them. They, like Renya, went to meet weapons dealers, went to meet people selling guns or but you know they, they and and bought materials from them putting pistols you know in they talk about their fashionable handbags mm -hmm. and in their pockets and in jars of marmalade and in teddy bears but ammunition explosives guns and bringing them back into the ghettos so these women and they did rescue work um, as I was saying before, helping to find hiding spots bringing people out of labor camps out of ghettos and, and trying to place them somewhere so these young women really the, sh the nerve centers because they they were the internet they connected yeah, they tied everything to these yeah. locked communities these imprisoned communities across poland because the because the word courier doesn't really capture right it, it's a and and I, I don't know if there's a translation issue in that or if it's simply that there isn't really a good word for what they did um you also talk about a, a kind of a, a gender role reversal that takes place uh, in the resistance because, um, you know, women have certain advantages uh, in this in this terrible time. Things have, have quite changed around a bit. 
So first of all, the Hebrew word for these women's role is keshariot, which is connectors. So it's a little better than couriers, but still does it, doesn't do them justice. Um, yeah, so women, Jewish women, were at an advantage in the sense that it, it was easier for them to work on the outside, on the Aryan side. And this is because it was easier for Jewish women to perform Christianity. And there are three sort of general umbrella reasons for that. One of them is Jewish women were not circumcised. If a Jewish man was on the outside and he was suspected of being Jewish, he would at gunpoint be told to drop his pants. I mean, women simply didn't have that physical marker of their Jewishness on their body. They didn't have that threat. Um, also, in the 1930s, Jewish women, were they went to school. Education was mandatory for boys and girls in Poland. But in many Jewish families, they would send their sons to private Jewish schools, religious schools. But to save on tuition, they sent their daughters to Polish public schools like Renia. And in these public schools, these women, first of all, they had a lot of Catholic friends. They came to, they had an awareness of Polish Catholic culture and mores and habits, uh, personal habits. Like, look at me here on the screen. I'm gesticulating. That was very Jewish. And one woman writes about how she had to wear a muff when she went undercover <laughs> to just control herself. But women had an awareness uh, of these nuances of behavior and, and, and posture and cadence um, that men didn't always have. But more important even than any of that, is that Jewish women, they talk about this all the time in their memoirs. They learned to speak Polish like a Pole without the creaky Yiddish accent. So even if a man, a leader in the underground had to go somewhere outside the ghetto, he almost always traveled with a woman largely so she could do the talking, to buy the train ticket, to you know buy a newspaper. I mean, his accent would have given him away. Um, and then finally, you have, I mean, Nazi culture was classically sexist. Women just weren't expected to be participating in, in, you know, undercover military work. You know, why would this young, beautiful girl, you know, be carrying a bag full of ammunition? I mean, it didn't, it, it, it didn't dawn on them. And so Jewish women in the underground, they played to that being underestimated, uh, being not, you know, not suspected. Um, so, so Judy, uh, um, I know there's no, there's no one story and there are lots of different stories, but, you know, overall, what was the reaction of male members of the resistance and male members of the Jewish community to these young Jewish women who said, no, I'm going to go? I mean, the, these were young people living in the most extreme and traumatic situations. So everyone just did what they could. Yeah. And they, like people had different strengths. People had different capabilities and abilities. And this is something that, that women could do. Um, and they, I mean, they just did it. Uh, I want to uh, bring in a question from one of our viewers, uh, Skip Cornett. Uh, and he says, uh, since these women were crossing boundaries into the Catholic and Polish communities, did they find collaborators in the secular or Christian communities? Yes, there were um, mentions. Uh, there, there were there were um, uh, Christians who helped them. Um, there were connections with the Polish underground. But the Polish underground, there were two Polish undergrounds. Um, there were a lot of Jewish undergrounds as well. So. And all these undergrounds didn't always get along, even though they had this common enemy. Um, but there were at times connections between the um, the home army, the people's army, the Jewish underground. I mean, for instance, in my book, a woman that comes up, Irina Adamovich, she was a bit older in her 30s. She was Christian and she really helped the, the groups um, that I'm talking about, she herself went to Vilnas, gave information, helped supply Jews with arms, gave them information, brought people into the ghetto. She had a pass to go into the ghetto as a social worker, I think. She helped bring people in, bring people out. So there were definitely examples of um, collaboration. 
And uh, there were other ones you talked about where, where people are essentially charging to help you. You know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll help you if you pay us a lot of money and maybe we'll betray you in the process. Well, hiders. There were, um, there were you know, people say some, it's hard to know statistics, but people, you know, 20, 30,000 Jews in hiding in Warsaw alone. Mm. And there, there are people who've also written books around for every Jew that was in hiding, there were, you know, four Catholic Poles that had to help them just maintain this life. So, and, and they were often paid, not always, but they were often paid. Um, in fact, some of these young Jewish women, part of their job uh, was to pay hiders to take care of Jews in hiding. And they would come, uh, this woman, Vlad Kamid, I, I think we have a photo of her in, in the collection. Yes. Yeah. So this is, a, let me tell you a bit about her. So she, I mean, she was incredible. She brought, she spooned dynamite into the Warsaw ghetto through a hole in a basement wall to help the Warsaw um, ghetto uprising. She was an incredible underground operative. And this was a picture taken of her in central Warsaw in 1944. Mm. And here she is pretending to be a Christian, young Christian woman out on the town for a day of you know, theater, lunch, shopping. Um, in 44, there was no more ghetto. The ghetto had been destroyed. And at this point, she was working entirely in rescue. Her organization helped 12,000 Jews in hiding in Warsaw. And she and her her colleagues would dress up like this and walk around Warsaw, and they would go check up on Jews in hiding. They they would write in their memoirs. I always look at her bag here. They would write about how they would walk around with bags full of cash, you know, their hearts pounding, and they would pay off hiders, and they would often have to move their charges. Um, if, if it wasn't safe anymore, they would bring trusted medical help. They would bring trusted photographers to take photos for fake IDs. They would bring books. She, there's one story where um, it, she was helping to hide a musician and she couldn't bring a piano, but she brought composition paper so he could you know, write something. Um, she tells stories in her memoirs about how people would write applications to her for money. Um, one I remember, a, a Jewish dentist said he's doing well pretending to be Christian, he, but he needs a bit of money to buy the latest dental equipment so he can upgrade and sustain his practice through the winter. And, and so she gave him that, he applied to her organization for funding and she would go through these applications and find these people and, and help them and pay them. Um, wow. Incredible. Wow. So, well, kind of along those lines, um, I'm going to try if I don't. Hopefully, I won't mess this up here. Wait, wait. Look oh, that. well, you are hey. a technical genius. All right. So, one of the questions um, it was I, I was going to ask something similar. Um, how did they support themselves, and, and where's the money coming from? And I tack onto that. How is that being managed? I mean, how do you know? Like, because you talk about there's an American Relief Committee, and they're donating money. How does the money get to them and then how do they get it out to other people? So when I first started reading these accounts, they all talk about this money. They were bringing the money. They had money hidden in their shoe. There was money to, I mean, we're not talking about huge amounts right, of right, money, right. but there are a lot of people. So, so the first, uh, one of my first research stops was the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And I went to meet, you know, a head researcher there. And my first question was, where is the book? on the money, money in the ghettos. What, what, and he said, there is no book <laughs> on the money in the ghettos. Um, you have to write that book on the money in the ghettos. So I ended up doing quite a bit of you know, primary document research into trying to understand where this money came from. And I do I have a long footnote in the book where I, where I talk about how I, how I came across these figures and these money. But, um, there, there were different places where the money for the underground, and so there's the money in the ghetto, but I'm talking right. for the underground. So some money came from a lot of money. So the it's called the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee. It still exists today. It's an American-based uh, organization that's global, helps Jews around the world. Um, and it turns out that throughout the war, they supplied, at the time, 
$78 million to Jews in Europe, wow. which is now equivalent to about 1.1, I believe, billion dollars. Wow. So there were funds coming in. Now, some, again, it's so complicated right, right. because at certain times, borders shut and currency could no longer pass across borders. Like 41 was a time where there was a more stringent control of currency. And then you had to get sm people smuggling in money. So it often went to London. London had an outpost of the Polish government who ran yeah. part of the Polish underground and they smuggled money. And then everyone complained that they, the groups were taking commissions and currencies and the money. But there was there was kind of a system of how the money passed. There was also money collected within Poland from the JDC and from other organizations because Jews were not allowed to own money. I think they were not allowed to have over 2,000 yeah, Jwati. Yeah. So many of them gave their money to these charities with the promise or the hope that they would get it back after the war. Um, of course, most people were killed. There wasn't after the war, but the charities then distributed these monies in Poland itself. And part of it went to the underground. So I know that 400 thousand i believe went to the warsaw underground in 1943 and so some of the monies came from this the underground also robbed banks they also uh there's some great stories they they you know if they saw a jew was collaborating with the nazis they would kidnap their family members and say we're not gonna you know let you go unless you give us some of your money um so there were and they also had businesses they, there are stories about some underground groups making certain foods or or selling things sometimes they sold fake papers they made a bit of money so it's all to say it's a it's a complicated yeah. story that's that's no one's really pieced together in full but and money comes from different sources well but i mean you know, just to have that system however complex it is in place means that there's a level of organization that that's, you don't really that's think so about. different than what we usually kind of hear right. about or or the histories tell that's what i'm saying a vodka meets organization helped twelve thousand jews in hiding right. I mean, it's huge. Even if it's a little bit of money, like that's how many people were involved. These underground organizations were, I mean, they, they were compared to my impression before doing this research. They're right. really, they're massive. They're very organized. There are many people involved. Right. Yes. So uh, maybe the best known uh, act of Jewish resistance in Poland is the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943. And I, if I remember correctly from reading your book, something like one third of the fighters uh, involved in that are, are women. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about their experiences? And one of your characters very involved in that is Zivia Lubetkin and, uh, and tell us about her as well. Sure. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, if you have time. <laughs> no, I can't. No, I can't. Um, the, uh, so the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, I'd heard of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising before coming across any of this material. But to be honest, I didn't really know what happened. I certainly hadn't understood that this was a very planned and organized uprising. And I also had had no idea that this was an uprising conducted by teenagers, basically, or Jews in their young 20s. Um, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was, I, I, I mean, fully planned and orchestrated by the underground. One of its leaders was Zivia Lebetkin, a woman, that's Zivia there, um, and um, Itzhak Zuckerman, her husband, who is also a leader in the underground. Um, and the, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was, there was a smaller uprising in January of that year in 43. It was more of an impromptu uprising, but they learned lessons about military strategy from that uh, January, they called the mini, the mini uprising. And they, they began to understand that instead of having guerrilla fighters go in 
with the Jews being taken to the trains, it was better to attack from within buildings. It was better to surprise Nazis. It was better to lure them into closed spaces and then shoot them or blow them up in, in, in those spaces. So th this, is, um, this is actually a Nazi photograph from a Nazi collection of one of the underground bunkers in the Warsaw ghetto. Um, they, they called them the bandits, the Jewish underground. So this was a bandits living quarters. Um, mm. In the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of April 43, each youth movement group, there were different youth movements, and the different groups were each military units, and they lived and worked together in a different part of the ghetto, and they each had a different role. So some of them, their job was they, bl they blew up an entrance. So they put up a bomb on, near an entrance where Nazis would enter during the liquidation. Other groups, like Zivia's group, she, ha she had a gun. She they lured the Nazis into a building. A man pretended to be reading a book, and they thought they were going to get him. And then people pounced from cupboards and shot them, took their weapons. So these were considered... I mean, for people that had absolutely no military training, they were very they were very organized. The groups had ways, uh, plans for how to connect with each other, how to communicate with each other. There was there was working telephones in parts of the ghetto, and they had ways of like alerting each other to what was happening, to when when to shoot, when to start. Um, so it was it was not and yes, and a third of the women in the there were, there were actually two Jewish undergrounds who were fighting in April 43. Um, one was the more socialist group and one was the more religious group. And of the socialist secular group, um, they called the ZOB um, was their name, the Jewish fighting organization in Polish. Uh, a third of them were women. And one of them talks about how she, you know, Masha Fiedermilch, she was in the Bundes group. And she talks about how she, you know, climbed onto the roof, and, and she was her duty. And many women, this was they, they, they threw the Molotov cocktails, they threw the explosives, and her duty was to she had to go on the roof and light. And her hands were shaking so much she could mm. barely light the match, but she did it, and and you know, flung it, and and all she heard was Nazis cry out, "In Frau Kampf, in Frau Kampf, a woman is fighting." They, they couldn't believe it. And I heard that story from a number of sources as well. Um, but yes. So, so Judy, Zivia was, I'm going to get the street address wrong, but Zivia was actually at Mila, is it 19 or 18? what is the? 18 the, Mila. Eight, Mila. 18 Mila. So she's actually there at one point, and that's kind of where they make their last stand, and, and she gets out. Um, and one of the things that really kind of grabbed me about her is earlier in the book you talk about you know she's she's resisting she's accepted that she's going to die but she's going to go down fighting and she's going to she's going to fight back and that seemed to be a, a real motivator for her um but further along in the book after she gets out and as she survives you say that she's talking to people and she's saying it's important that you live and I, that transition really kind of struck me and i was wondering after the uprising, were they saying, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe there's hope or how did that, how did she change, do you think? I'm not exactly sure what moment you're referring to. Well, it's I just more what as I was reading it. I think what happened was that, you know, let's start with this. So hmm. why are we fighting? We're, not, we're a bunch of starving 18 year old Jews. We're not going to topple the Nazis. Right. Why fight? And this was a big discussion that they had. What is motivating us? And for many of them, it was we are fighting for dignity. We are fighting to die in action. We are fighting for, for our pride and for future generations dignity as well. Um, and as such, they were, to some degree, suicide fighters. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, they, they didn't expect to live. Right. The, the, the ZOB did not create bunkers for themselves. They imagined that they were going to go out there, throw their bombs, shoot, you know, um, detonate their, their explosives, and, and die. 
and they didn't even they didn't have supply when they lived they were shocked they couldn't believe it they didn't have supplies for themselves that is why she ended up in mila 18 that was a massive bunker actually set up by like the jewish underworld right. um and many of the underground ended up there because they didn't have anywhere else to go they didn't think they'd still be alive um so i, I think I mean, I think many times for many of these women, and, and this was important for me too, to write about, they, they, they wanted to die. They couldn't right. take it anymore. There were times where they, they just, they, 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 they lost it. Sure. They weren't always, you know, sure, uh, yeah. bravado. So, I, I mean, I, I guess that there is a shift. I'm not sure ex again what moment you're referring to. Well, I don't think it was a moment, but I just remember as I was reading, as I was following, I was really interested in her because she, I had been to Mila, and, and I'm curious about that. And there's there's a point in the book where you talk about either she was talking to somebody or somebody was talking about her, and they're talking about the importance of living, as opposed to the importance of going Dying. down guns yeah. a blazing. And I that just struck me, you know, um, because obviously you know why the uprising is this amazing act of defiance, right? And I, I understand, you know, they don't they don't expect to topple the Nazi regime, but. I I, I think maybe you're talking about there was a, a moment where the ZOB was so, this was before the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. They were planning an uprising and their leaders were caught and their their weapons, they were moving their weapons cache in a bicycle basket yeah. across the ghetto and the, the woman was caught and everything was taken away. And there was such a feeling of everything we've planned for and worked for is gone. We can't, there was such a feat, there was a, the group decided to commit mass suicide. They were going to get whatever explosives they could, try to just blow up whatever they could, but blow themselves up in the moment too. Right. And it was her then boyfriend and, and future husband, Itzhak Zuckerman, who sort of brought everyone together and, and gave a speech saying, you know, kill, what's the point of killing ourselves? Um, you know, let's let's fight, but let's you know, let's live. That right. is the real, you know, that's defiance too, and right. and um, let's not just suicide. Throw that's just doing away. the work for them. You can um, you can easily imagine that that um, emotions and feelings about that run all over the place. I mean, it's so hard. I I think for us to put ourselves in that situation to have, you know because none of us have faced. I think it's fair to say. I, I don't know you that well, Judy, but none of us have faced the kind of desperate pressure, uh, horror, terror, you know, add on your adjectives there that they faced. And I could easily imagine being suicidal one day and defiant the next day in that situation. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to uh, ask you about a couple of other people. You have some sure. fantastic pictures in your book and some fantastic stories in your book. And I and I. I don't think I can I can go any further without asking you about this uh, young woman. She was known to the Germans as uh, Little Wanda with the braids. Uh, her name is Nusha. Nusha, I think I've got that right. Uh, tell us a little bit about her. It's, it's just one sort of episode in the book, but it's it's a really quite exceptional one. Well, Nusha Teitelbaum was uh, grew up in in Vuj and moved to Warsaw to attend university. She studied history at the Warsaw University. She was a communist. So she was in the communist youth group, which was more radical even than my youth groups. Um, but in during the war, she became uh, one of her, her underground colleagues called self-appointed executioner. And one of Nusha's roles out of many things that she did was she would, at this time she was in her early 20s, but she would braid her hair. That photo was from before the war, by the way, that's in her school outfit. Um, but she would braid her hair and put on peasant clothes and perform as a young Polish farm girl, a peasant girl. And she used her innocent look to, uh, to, to attack. So in one story, there's a couple of, of good ones um, and incredible ones. But, in, you know, in one story, she comes up to Susha, which is the Gestapo headquarters in Warsaw. And she play, you know, plays innocent and says, I need to see certain 
certain officer at, at, to the guards at the door, they assume that she's pregnant. Uh, she's gotten pregnant by this officer and she wants to tell him and talk to him. Whatever. So they, they let her in. She's very beautiful. Um, and she goes into this Gestapo man's office and takes out a gun and shoots him in the head and then puts the gun away and walks back out um, and waves goodbye to the guards. And, you know, and that's why she was called Little Wanda with the braids. Um, and she was on every Gestapo most wanted list. And, um, and there's another story with her where she she shoots two, uh, three uh, Gestapo officers, kills two of them and uh and one is wounded and then she sneaks into the hospital and and dispatches the uh the, the person who was only wounded and and the stories about her are and she was later killed um uh, during the war the stories about her are so exceptional did you when you came across this did you ever look at it and say well well wait a minute i maybe i should double check this because this is so outrageous. I mean, this is so extreme. I wonder if it, if it really is true the way it is reported. I mean, I think I quadruple hundred times <laughs> tried to check everything. I, I mean, you know, there's, you're working with, I, I mean, I'm building this out of memoirs and out of testimonies and out of as many memoirs and testimonies that I could find. And, you know, matching that with whatever historical uh, discussion and representation there is of the period. And I came across these stories of Nusha in a number of, mm. of source documents. Um, and, yeah. Uh, I mean, she was incredible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Judy, well, you know, of course, one of the big, the $20,000 questions is your book is bursting with stories of courage and bravery and defiance and just these women are jaw dropping. Why, why don't we know this part of the story? I mean, Freud in the book that you stumbled upon, um, was published and I think you mentioned that there was a small edition uh, that was you found in English uh, but given the amount of material that's been written about the Holocaust and the Warsaw Uprising and all this how did this story escape for so long um do I get twenty thousand yeah, dollars well yeah. <laughs> sure Rick will yeah. Rick is the, yeah, Rick is the tech department yeah. and the accounting department I, 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 I have the checkbook right here. I'm prepared to write the check right now. Well, good, because I have an answer. Um, so look, this is, I mean, this was the, a, a sub question of all my research. Like, on the one hand, what happened? What's the story? Right. And on the other hand, what happened to this story? Right. How, how could I not know this? Right. Um, and at one point I called my editor and I said, I think this whole book should be about what happened to the story. Right. Um, she did not let me do that, but she did let me keep a section in toward the end of the book where I deal with this in a little bit more detail. Um, but I'll give you in my last few minutes, uh, a very, very brief summary. And I think it's, first of all, we're dealing with two stories that haven't been told or have been underreported. One of them is the story of Jewish resistance at all. all right, right. And the other one is the story of women's experience in the Holocaust. And there are reasons that both of these stories have been underrepresented, let's say. Some of it is political and it has to do with specifically how, how the narratives of the Holocaust are shaped by political motives. Um, and we can even see that in, in Poland that was happening the past couple of years when they're saying that, you know, they couldn't be blamed or there was trying to be legislation around what story could be told. Um, some of that is zeitgeist. And we are, we've simply been interested in different elements of the Holocaust at different times and also uncomfortable about different elements of the Holocaust at different times. Uncomfortable talking about women, uncomfortable talking about violent resistance. Um, people still feel uncomfortable about that. Um, and then there's also a, a lot of this, I think, is really down to the personal. And the fact that many of these women just didn't tell their story. And they either, either they told it in the 40s and then stopped telling it, 
Mm. Or they didn't tell it at all until much more recently. And some of the reasons they didn't talk much were because they were not believed or mm. they were accused. There was, I heard this many times, there was kind of this idea that the pure souls perished. But if you survived, it's because you did something. <laughs> and something you're a collaborator or you slept your way to safety um these women often felt accused or at least guilty that they had fled their families to be part of an underground and hadn't saved their parents um many of them felt guilty that compared to their their survivor peers who had uh sur been through camps been through auschwitz like they hadn't had it that bad as part of the underground. Um, and they didn't merit telling the story. And then finally, I'm writing about women who were so young during the war. And when the war was over, they were, you know, they're like 20 years old and they had nothing. They had no family, they had no home. They had no nationality, Like their country didn't even exist. They, they had, they, they, they were often, re they were refugees, usually in countries where they didn't even speak the language. And they, it, they needed to start over. They needed to, to start a fresh story. And they were women, and many of them felt a, a real, almost divine kind of duty to have children, to repopulate the Jewish people. They, and they just wanted to raise normal families. Mm -hmm. And, and just didn't talk about it with their children until much, much later in life. I know you've got this, there's a great photo and, and we are running out of time, but there's a great photo in your book. Mm -hmm. And on the right there is Renya with one of her uh, granddaughters. And I think this is in 2008 or something uh, around that time period. And, and uh, I, you know, I'm looking at that face and it's not somebody, if I met her on the street, I'd say, well, that's a person who went through all this t horrible, terrible stuff, or that's a, that's the freedom fighter hero. And it, it really is just kind of an amazing, uh, uh, an amazing coda in some way to the story. Um, she survived, Zivia survived, um, somebody asked how, how many survived. I, I know numbers are really hard because how many are you basing it on? But a lot of people died also, I mean, didn't survive. And that's, that's a factor in telling story as well. Most people were killed. I mean, mm -hmm. Poland had 3.3 million Jews before the war, 300,000 survived. So underground, not underground, most Probably about Jews 90% were killed. Died. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So to, uh, oh. Can I? Well, I, I had one, but I'll oh, go, go ahead. I'll, no, I'll, no, no, no. Okay. It was your turn. Okay. It's all you. No, no I, I just want to ask, um, you have, you, you corrected me when we were chatting before the show. You haven't been working on this for 12 years. It's now 14 years. You have a, a, a movie option that we, we hope comes to fruition. You have, I know, really, you have a um, uh, events booked into 2023. Um, this has become a big chunk of your life, which I'm sure you didn't expect the day you came across that book. I would ask you, how has it changed you? Okay, with one minute left. <laughs> you take as long as you My, like. Mine would have been easier, Judy. I just want to take as long as you like. <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors, and yet I too had sort of, I don't know, I didn't buy this myth of Jewish passivity. I don't even know how. I, it wasn't even conscious. But this work, of course, has shown me that this, I mean, Jewish experience, I mean, this was a story of constant resilience and defiance and struggle and activity. Um, just most people were killed because they were up against a sadistic, brutal military force. But this was not a story of passivity or inactivity in, in any way. Um, but I think, you know, if it's how it's really affected me on a personal level, I, I, I think that, you know, when I went into this at the beginning, I told you that I, I was interested in how trauma has passed over generations. It's something I think about a lot, the difficulty that I inherited from having come from a family that was traumatized by the Holocaust. 
But I feel that I've come out with of this project, or if I ever come out of it, but <laughs> coming out of it, I, you know, I, I've also come to understand or appreciate that the other thing that was passed on was strength and passion and fury and and a sense of justice and and compassion. And you know, my grandmother was one of the strongest, most compassionate people that I know. And that that along with any trauma, that passed on too. So I think I'm I'm trying to hold both of those in my self. Well, Judy Battalion, thank you so much for Thanks joining so us much, today. Judy. And and I, I, somebody did ask, is, is there a difference between the blue book and the red book behind you? There is. The blue book is a young reader's edition. Okay. And it is geared at ages 10 to 14. And it's, um, I worked with someone who specializes in writing for that age group. And so it is. Um, it is a shorter Great. version of the book. So yeah. there is there is a, a that version, and there is of course uh, the version that is a New York Times bestseller, "The Light of Days," uh, the untold story of women resistance fighters in Hitler's ghettos. Definitely, uh, 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 Ju Judy is just as passionate in her writing as she is in her speaking. So definitely worth taking a look at. Judy, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you so much for having me. Best. Cheers. Best wishes, best good luck. Hope, hope to watch the movie. Soon, soon. <laughs> it's from your mouth to God's ear, Chris. There we okay. go. Yeah, there we go. go. Um, so, Chris, oh, wow. What a, what a show. Um, yes, and, it's wonderful. Um, uh, fantastic. Um, and what are we serving up next week? What's going yeah, on? Yeah, so next week we're shifting gears a little bit. We have um, a gentleman named Ed Sherwood on the show, and he's talking about his book, Courage Under Fire. Uh, and Ed, uh, Mr. Sherwood was a young second lieutenant uh, in the 101st Airborne, the 501st Infantry Regiment in Vietnam. Uh, and he was involved in an action at a place called Tam Kai, um, which was happening at the same time as Hamburger Hill. Um, and it's been a kind of a forgotten about uh, battle because of the casualties and the controversy around Hamburger Hill. Tam Kai got brushed up, so uh, uh, Mr. Sherwood went back, got some declassified information, has written the story of that. It's very, battle, very so. well reviewed. Looking forward to taking a look at it. Yep, uh, if you've read, uh, if you read uh, Joe Galloway's book, "We Were Soldiers Once and Young," Joe Galloway says it's he recommends the book highly. So. Excellent. Well, we appreciate everybody joining us today for another History yes. Happy Hour, and we want to express our gratitude to those of you who are helping us keep the history tabs open by supporting us on Patreon. And a special shout-out, Chris, to our top-shelf Patreon supporters, Eric Flint, Stephen Dean, and Stephen Ferber. And if you'd like to help support the show by becoming a, a subscriber, you know, here it is, begging for, here's the begging for money link. <laughs> this, okay. is, this is when we sound like WGBH. I know, I know. Viewers like you. Viewers like you, thank you very much. Well, Chris, I think it's now probably about time that we shut the lights off and shut down the pub. What do you think? I think so, probably. Be safe, everybody. Thank you.